So today we'll uh, cover a couple of methods to make these complex diagrams a little more complex, and then we'll spend the rest or most of the day doing an activity that will end up contributing to the assignment that is due on Sunday. So we'll go to knock out most of that today. So the idea here is we would like to come up with realistic causal loop diagrams that are more complex than single loop diagrams. And so, you know, there's a little practice for that. So I've got this one up here. Uh, and this is one that I took uh, from Met Office, which is kind of like uh, the sort of uh, British version of the Weather Authority. And they are trying to communicate that climate feedback can be both positive and negative. So it feels like they're, they've got this kind of causal loop thinking. Um, but the, uh, I say, you know, how do the variables create challenges for labeling the links? So what are some of the problems with some of the choices that they've made for the, the nodes or the variables of this causal loop? What sort of rules are they violating that we're saying that we try to abide by when we do causal loop diagrams? They're all verbs. All verbs, yeah. So I see creates, slows down, speeds up, creates. So it's more of a temporal diagram than a causal loop diagram. So they're saying like, well, if you, if you create change, whatever that change is, so that's another kind of confusing thing, then uh, maybe that'll slow down the warming, which will create more change or something. But it's all, it's kind of a, a once this thing happens, then this other thing will happen. So when we're going to we build a model for this, it would be very difficult because then you kind of like say, well, what, what are we actually modeling? What is this verb? We need nouns before we can get verbs. And so uh, is it an, an but you say, well, then can I just remove the verbs? But if I remove the verbs, I just get like change and warming. So it, it's, it's still not detailed enough. So what I want uh, us to do here, so you know, with your neighbor, take you know, the next minute or so, and I've put question marks on the four different blocks and on all the links here. I'm saying this is a positive feedback, and this is a negative feedback. Can you come up with a simple causal loop diagram of this structure, a positive feedback and a negative feedback, that captures kind of noun the phrases here, and captures this positive and negative combination that goes into global warming or climate change. So, you know, take the next like, minute or whatever and just come up with, you know, your guesses for models that you could put into this format. You can do it with your neighbor. Score by default. So 
the thing that the earth would be absorbed in sunlight and then kind of turn it into heat. So if you reflect it away, it's not doing that. All right, let's, uh, let's bring things back here, kind of this kind of uh, global brainstorming. So do we have um, some ideas here? Maybe the positive feedback is easier to see for some people, just as a guess. Are there any uh, volunteers? That, you know, what, what do you think would be at least one of the variables that might participate in this positive feedback? So like, when we think about climate change, uh, and you know, it's already cited this notion of global warming, what seems to be like, what is changing? What, what, what is sort of seems like it should be a variable that we need in India? Or it's like, what's warming? Like, what do we mean by warming? How do we capture that? What would be modeling the warming of the Earth? Yeah. Temperature, that seems like a good one. So, you know, I don't know where temperature might go in here, but, um, but I could, maybe temperature goes here. And I, I actually don't remember what I have on the next slide, but maybe temperature is a good one to go in here because as temperature goes up, then maybe, um, I don't know, as temperature goes up, maybe this, whatever, it's hard to say exactly this. It's almost like this, I, I feel like global warming. I almost feel like I should have actually notched this one out too and put in a variable here. But, but I could say maybe there's a plus this. Temperature goes up, then maybe global warming goes up. So what's something else that might go here that would close this positive feedback loop? If temperature's down here, what's another variable that might go up here? I heard people say, yeah. Uh, CO2, that, yeah, that's maybe that. Sure, why not? Um, so I could say maybe that there is some process. I would have to justify this. But maybe with more global warming, maybe there is a process that will release uh, more CO2. Now, I'd have to justify that. Like, you know, I'd have to say, well, how does, how does that work? But if I at least had a narrative where I could justify that link, then I could draw that link. And then I could say, with more CO2, maybe I get more greenhouse effect, and so my temperature will then go up. That is something that I can probably justify. And then with more temperature, maybe I get more of whatever this global warming quantity that I'm, I'm feeling kind of fuzzy about here. But, the, but then that would then lead to this more CO2. So the only thing I have to worry about is, is coming up with a physical reason to justify this link over here. But maybe I could do that. What are some other things I could have put up here besides CO2? What are other things that we kind of uh, have seen that with the positive feedback that involves that involves here uh, that as temperature goes up, what are some other things that happen? Urban there, well, there could I mean it, it might still be hard to sort of see how global warming contributes to that urban heat. Like, what are some things more more geophysical? Ice. Ice. Ice would be one that you know I could put up here. So maybe um, you know in order to. If I put ice here, then maybe I have to play a little bit with the arrows here. Like, as I get more ice, I get more reflection. So maybe I get less temperature. And as I get more temperature, more global warming, maybe I get less ice. So maybe if I take the ice route up here, I have to put minuses here and maybe a minus here. So these minuses go along with the ice. But because I have two minuses, I still get a positive feedback. So you can imagine there's a couple of different things I could put in there. Any thought about uh, the negative feedbacks? What are the, we often don't talk about the negative feedbacks, and we'll talk about why we don't talk about them. But what are some negative feedbacks in climate change? It's a little harder. You don't get as much press. So how would that be a negative feedback? Well, I'm just saying, like, like more climate change would lead to less species of person. And then, and then, how does that then loop back around into something that leads to back to the, this global warming? 
Is there a link there you can see? So again, this negative feedback loop here saying, um, we often don't talk about this loop, but there are these loops, like climate change can't go on forever. Eventually, it will slow down. And what are the things that slow climate change? Yeah, in the back. Um, so increase in carbon in the plus, um, which would make us have more carbon in the atmosphere, and then more fire in the atmosphere. So we have three forms of carbon in the plus. Okay, and so keep, and then how do we keep going? And then uh, the negative would be that the trees that grow get in the job more carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's so that's an interesting, so that's a, uh, that's a hypothesis, right? Like you could have, um, if we had carbon, carbon could actually participate in multiple loops simultaneously. So you could imagine there could be a carbon dioxide link here. And maybe as you get more carbon in the air, you get more tree growth. And maybe if you get in a more and more tree growth, maybe that tr those trees, through a number of different effects, end up actually having a cooling effect on the planet. And with a cooling effect on the planet, maybe that will end up leading to you know, less carbon emissions, or the trees will just sequester more. And there are other sort of sequestra sequestration. But the point is here is that usually when we draw a positive feedback, we might focus on that positive feedback because we might be excited about the growth in a, in a, in a sort of a virtuous cycle. Or in a vicious cycle, we might be really, really worried about how this will, will turn out. But eventually, Things can't grow forever. No tree grows to the sky. Whenever we have a positive feedback, we always have to anticipate that there is some negative feedback. And then the question is often, what is the kind of rate of change of this negative feedback? How long are we going to have to wait until this negative feedback kicks in? So the example that I had here was like ice and albedo. So with more global warming, you get less ice. If you had more ice, you'd get more albedo. And if you add more albedo, you get less global warming. And since there are two minuses, that was my positive feedback. So that was one way I did ice. On my side, instead of sequestering carbon in trees, I thought about sequestering carbon in shells. So you could imagine that as you get more global warming, you get more chemical weathering. So uh, things weather away. And with more chemical weathering, you get more of that um, being dumped into shells. And with more of that being dumped into shells, it pulls that carbon out of the, uh, the atmosphere, and so you end up getting less global warming. So in potentially, you have other places you can sequester this carbon. And with a hotter and hotter temperatures, you increase the rate of these chemical reactions that end up weathering this stuff away and then sequestering it somewhere else. This is a very slow process, but if things got bad enough, then this weathering process would happen quick enough that this would start becoming a, a, a significant player between these two loops. We're not there yet, which is a big reason why we mainly focus on the positive feedbacks, because they're so much faster. But there's always a negative feedback whenever you start with a positive feedback. The question is, do you include it in your model? And the, really, the, you know, the reason to not include it would be that it's so slow that over the short time period you're running your model, it doesn't really change enough to really affect this much at all. But if you simulate the Earth over you know, another billion years, then actually this does start becoming an important feedback to include. Um, and if we didn't include that, then our models of the Earth would be wrong. But if we're going over 100 years or 1,000 years, then maybe we can just focus on this simple. So we add complexity when we're focusing on a time scale where that complexity will make a difference. And so that's where let's read at this side one here. So there are questions about that example. That the positive feedback is one we talk about all the time because it's so salient. It really it is at a time scale of interest to us. But if we zoom out and think of a geological time scale, then there are feedbacks that will put global warming in check. The stabilized operating point of the system may not be habitable for humans, but the Earth will you know, come, it will stabilize. The temperature of the planet can't go up forever. It eventually has to stop, and this is one of the things that will end up slowing it down. Any questions about that, about why we get, yeah? Can you repeat why you don't talk about this really much? Yeah, it's because it, at least in climate change, the negative feedbacks that we get for free from the Earth are usually so much slower 
and so much, so on a time scale that's of interest to us, on, on my life or your life, this, we're not ever going to make it around this circle here. So pretty much uh, the amount of biosequestration in shells when I was born will be roughly the same as when I die. And so there's, there's not going to be a whole lot of sinking into shells if I just count on the Earth doing it in my lifetime. Now, in a thousand lifetimes or a million lifetimes, then maybe there's a difference. And so if I zoom out and look at a much bigger time scale, then this slow feedback starts, if I want to predict the fate of the Earth um, a million years ahead of time, then in that case, maybe I need both of these. But the fate of the Earth a thousand years, maybe not. Now, well, another way we can say that is, well, maybe we need faster feedbacks. Now, part of the, the thing that we'd say, well, you know, if we care about sustainability, if this positive feedback on, with, the, with the feedbacks we get for free from the Earth, if we cannot sustain human activity in the face of this positive feedback, maybe what we need to do is introduce a negative feedback that's not there. And so you could probably imagine building a negative feedback involving human behavior. With, and this is why the economists hated Jay Forrester's uh, you know, dynamical models, is that he did not include the negative feedbacks that come out of economics and human behavior. As the Earth gets hotter, eventually the politics kind of get brushed aside and people start taking action. And that action might involve using less fossil fuels. Maybe. Maybe using more renewables. Maybe. I don't know. But you could come up with a bunch of different theories here where as you with more and more global warming, you get more and more interventions, say, from human systems, not just these biogeochemical systems. And that might have a faster feedback. And I think what a lot of people who study climate change uh, are trying to argue is that if you don't start kicking in these artificial negative feedbacks, then it'll be impossible to ever build an artificial negative feedback that will, uh, that will effectively slow this one down. And all we'll be left with is waiting for the natural feedbacks to come into play. So maybe let's start early uh, before this positive feedback really accelerates and hits that inflection point. So that's kind of the thought. We either don't talk about the negative feedbacks because they're too slow, or we don't talk about the negative feedbacks because we are trying to encourage people to put in their own negative feedbacks. So if I present climate change this way to a skeptical audience, and if I am trying to convince them that they should be interested in adjusting their behavior in light of climate change, then maybe me drawing this negative feedback that is so slow that it probably is ineffectual is not a useful thing to me include in my model. Model as communication. Putting it on here makes it sound like it, the problem just will naturally fix itself. Leaving it off communicates to people that, may, that I am claiming that this problem will not take care of itself, and the only way we can take care of it is by adding our own negative feedbacks. So you have to make those decisions on when you include your models. Not only in trying to make the model more accurate, but trying to communicate the idea that you want to communicate. Does that make sense? And why it's so rare to see these negative feedbacks in, you know, in popular media like this. All right, so one loop faster, one loop slower. Now, whenever I see a positive feedback reinforcing loop next to a negative feedback balancing loop, that tells me that I probably am going to see S-shaped growth. So on the y-axis here, you might imagine that's temperature of the planet. The temperature planet, it starts low, it accelerates up, it hits an inflection point, and then it slows down and settles off at some new operating point up here. And this acceleration is mainly driven by this one, the reinforcing loop. And this deceleration happens because the variables that are reinforced here actually speed up the action of the variables over here until they become dominant. And so whenever we see these two loops next to each other, we get a hint that this might be the outcome. So that's one of the reasons we look for these types of loops here. So if we see these two things, we anticipate this dynamic mode of behavior. It doesn't necessarily have to happen. It could be that we're in some interesting parameter settings that maybe don't quite set this up. But this is maybe our first guess at what the behavior will be. Because that's very common whenever you have these two things next to each other. So, uh, so, our, so my question, so this is one we've been focusing on, and you've probably seen in a lot of your classes. 
how do we come up with these things ahead of time? How do we come up with more complex loops, uh, diagrams that have loops communicating with other loops? And so there are two ways that we can do this. We either can, the first way we're here is we're going to take a feedback first approach. And by with that, I mean, let's say we start with behavior over time and then use our vocabulary that we've built up, like S-shaped growth, to say these are the types of variables we might imagine uh, should be in our system. So as an example, if you were to flip to chapter five in your textbook, then he has a table of just a few behavioral modes that he thinks are particularly important. And what he means by that is if you look at a lot of behaviors out in human systems and natural systems, uh, that you'll see a lot of behaviors that grow apparently up forever, or at least they appear to grow forever, like climate change, even though they probably eventually get rounded out. They might uh, come back and, and seek some goal. They might have this S-shaped growth, where the, the negative feedbacks actually happen within a time scale of interest. They might oscillate. They might combine the two of these sorts of things, where you get growth and then oscillations, or growth and then collapse. And so these are modes of behavior that Moorcroft is saying, if you really think about a lot of systems as they change over time, you probably can find that a huge number of them fit into one of these six categories. And if you recognize these categories, then when you're trying to think about building a model, a model that helps you figure out how to intervene later on, you kind of already know what your model is going to look like. So as an example, I see oscillation. And I see oscillation is often caused by a balancing feedback with delay. So that tells me that when I'm looking at variables in my system, I have to say, where are there, is there a feedback here? And is there an aspect of that feedback that has a lot of delay? So as an example, in this water control example, I might say, you know what, I noticed that I never can get the temperature of the water right on the first, and I often am oscillating whenever I'm trying to set the temperature of the shower. Well, over here, I say, well, then let's think about where is the feedback loop there? Well, whenever I uh, feel the water temperature, there's a gap from what I'd like it to be. And I use that gap as a way to drive how I'm going to change the hot water flow. And when I change it, then maybe what's actually going on is I don't immediately feel the change from that. There's a delay there. So I end up moving it too far. And so then a little bit later, it feels like the water is getting hotter until I realize it's getting even hotter than I'd like it to be. And then I end up turning it back the other way. And so this suggests that these oscillations are due to the fact that I am trying to seek comfort. So that's a comfort seeking loop. But my, there's a delay between what I would like to happen and what actually happens. And it's that delay that's generating these oscillations. If I could somehow anticipate that delay, if I could say, I'm going to turn this not quite as much as I think I need to, anticipating that eventually I'm going to get that water, I might be able to move from the oscillating trajectory to a trajectory that oscillates a little bit and settles out, maybe even to a trajectory which rises quickly to the temperature I want. I still have to wait maybe a little bit, so maybe it's going to be more like this one, the common sense one here. So there might be a little bit of a delay, but at least I don't get those oscillations. And that's because I've incorporated into my, model, my mental model that my comfort-seeking loop with delay is what is causing the problem. And so I can now attack the delay. If I can't get rid of the delay, when I come up with my control policy for the flow of hot water, I can anticipate the delay so that I hopefully don't get these overshoots. So that is sort of a way of saying, how am I going to model the system? Start with the dynamics. Look at your vocab or look at your, your kind of glossary of dynamics. Say, when are these dynamics usually, uh, what, what types of systems do these dynamics generally usually generate these? They're these types of systems. Find the system in, find the model in the system that you are interested in, and then try to attack elements that you have now identified using the causal loop diagram. So that's one sort of example. Another example, S-shaped growth. So if I see S-shaped growth in a system, I see that it, it was rising, but then surprisingly it leveled off. So I want my company to do well, or I want the adoption of recycling to do well. And I noticed that people in the city, they started adopting, but then it suddenly leveled off. And 
not everybody, and of course, if everybody picked up, you know, recycling, that would eventually level off. But maybe it leveled off at a, at a level that was, that was lower than that. So I have to ask myself, you know, what's causing that? And then that tells me that I probably need to look for the reinforcing loop, which is probably was my main focus, advertising, recycling, et cetera. But then what's the balancing loop? At what point did my advertising stop being useful? People maybe, they start learning that you know, they ignore my ads over time. Or maybe there's only a certain market of people who pay attention to those ads. And so I end up saturating that market, and so on and so forth. So I need to look for this other loop that I did not anticipate when I initially deployed my strategy. The chickens and eggs kind of thing is that it's, you know, we did this positive feedback loop, which suggests that chickens will grow, you'll get a growing population of chickens forever. But chickens have to live their lives, and chickens do not live forever. Chickens have to cross the road. And with more chickens, you have more road crossings. With more road crossings, you have less chickens. So I might have anticipated an exponential growth in chickens, but in reality, life happens, and I end up leveling off at some, uh, some steady state of chickens. So I've got another sort of example here, but I think this is a terrible CLD. It's not one that I drew, but somebody drew it in VinSim of uh, the boy who cried wolf, uh, where you've got the success loop here that is driving the boy to cry wolf more, but then you've got the failure loop where people start ignoring the boy. And so ultimately, uh, you find that the boy will kind of flip, he will maybe will increase how much he cries wolf, but instead of continuing to cry wolf, might level out at some you know, background level of crying wolf because he's not always successful, but if he cries too much, people ignore him completely. So, you know, we can't always count on the growth. You've got to look for that other side there. So if we see this, we use these to sort of understand what's going on. And then the last one I want to mention here along, yeah, I'm sorry. So is we're labeling the reason we're giving the positive, positive the, the loops and success? Well, so on an assessment, uh, I there's a couple of these like balancing with delay, you should know. Just That's just an easy one to know. Um, things like growth with overshoot, this one here would be one that you know. I'd say those six, um, those are probably good ones to know. Those are, if I went back to those, that grid of six, these are ones that, uh, if I, on a cheat sheet, you could put these down, but I would say that it's just gonna be good practice to commit these ones to memory. Now, what we'll start today at the end of class and then continue with uh, the assignment that you'll work on, um, we'll work on today, but then we'll go into the reading that's tied to it on Thursday, is there's a whole other set of these that are much more complicated that I'm not going to ask you to memorize, but I'd like to be able, you to be able to follow kind of a decision tree through them if in case I gave you that decision tree, you could then sort of follow it and figure out, okay, so um, following this process, then I want this set of loops. But these are the ones that I would sort of commit to memory. Uh, these ones I think are, are pretty easy because they kind of build on each other. Growth, limited growth for example, um, and then you add delay to it, and you end up getting growth with overshoot. But if you get rid of the growth, so it's just the uh, balancing with the delay of oscillation. So these are like the really fundamental ones. That's the reason why more cross stresses those, and these are ones I would say try to have these down. And I think it'll be more clear if you do that. All right, so the last kind of example of this is if you did see um, growth and then oscillations, uh, that is typically you're going to find a reinforcing loop with a balancing loop as before, but then the oscillations come from that delay part. And so now I've got a growth loop, I've got a limitation loop on this side, and I put a little delay in one of the loops, typically the limitation loop, and that is very common, the source of, of, these, of these oscillations. So in Jay Forrester's models of human activity, uh, then he was saying that well, you could have these two different trajectories, one where you hit a global kerosene carrying capacity and then plummet, another one where you kind of hit it and uh, steady out. And it may be that the big difference here is the delay um, here in how you're using and recognize you're using natural resources. And so if you use a bunch of natural resources uh, and it has this delay on birth rate, 
that is a very large delay, then you can pump a lot of natural resources out of the ground. It can maybe amplify your birth rate, which then can end up um, reducing the amount of natural resources to a point that where you, you clearly go way below the old carrying capacity. But if you manage to somehow reduce this consumption so that the delay here is not as much of a problem or somehow reduce this delay, then maybe you won't get as much of the oscillations that things will sort of naturally steady out. And so it's a way of using, when you recognize patterns like this, that come up with a model like this that provides you a discussion framework to talk about what is generating your different patterns. And you can identify, though, maybe this delay is an issue. Maybe this link here and the way its rate relates to this rate is an issue. So this provides us a way of talking about systems that before, uh, if we just look at the behavior over time, we might not have any causal uh, framework for talking about. So that's our one way of building out more complicated CLDs, is starting from the behavior over times and then leading to the CLDs. But the other way to do it is to kind of go in the reverse direction. But before I get there and we move on to the, kind of the activity, um, are there questions about that basic idea, about this direction, starting with behavior over time and using it to motivate your causal loop diagrams? Yeah? So is the goal right now to draw causal loop diagrams from looking at line graphs? The goal here is to build frameworks, and that's in the next one will be not going this direction, but going this direction. Right now, I mean, I've taught you how to do causal loop diagrams, but the only causal loop diagram we're doing diagrams have really been building have been really simple ones. So the question is, how do you build out these complex causal loop diagrams that really capture interesting system dynamics? How do you decide when to put another loop in or when to add another variable? And so this is one way to do it, where you start with the behavior over times and you look up in a, in a table what patterns usually are associated with that behavior. This next route is going to go the other way, where you look at the processes in the system and then gradually link together loops that correspond to those processes. Okay. Right, any other questions? All right, so the other, uh, for to getting the even more advanced ones, where you may not know an easy mapping from behavior over time back to causal loops, there's a sort of process-centric recipe, and this will be on the back <coughs> of the assignment that I'll pass out today, which will be the one that's due on Sunday. And it's basically a decision tree, which I'll, I'll walk through some examples here. And this is borrowed from this kind of systems thinking website in an article that you'll read for, for uh, Thursday. And the basic idea here is you can say, what am I interested in in my particular system? So right here, I have one way through this decision tree. I am most concerned about growth. Well, taking me from growth says that I need a reinforcing loop. So if I'm interested in growth, I have to have a reinforcing loop. That could be a good growth or bad growth. I'm interested in uh, vicious or virtuous spirals, but I need that reinforcing loop. But nothing grows forever. So that tells me that wherever, not only do I do the reinforcing loop, but I have to come up with the balancing loop that will go along with it. So I add a balancing loop. My capacity is my limit, therefore my capacity isn't large enough. So typically, when we think about people with limitations here, they might build in an additional loop that tries to invest more in capacity in order to stave off the ultimate limitation. So maybe that's an additional feedback loop that I add. And then that's a way to get to a relatively complicated looking feedback loop. So as an example, I build this feedback loop. There's my initial growth, my growing action, and my demand. With more demand, I get more growing action. That can't happen forever. So I'm going to add in a performance thing. And I say that as I get more demand, my performance is going to start decreasing. And with decreasing performance, there's going to be less demand for, say, the product I'm trying to put out in the marketplace. And so I'm going to say, well, I recognize that's going to happen there. So I'm going to put in some process that helps me keep my performance up as my demand goes up. And so I have my original loop, the second loop I've added, and a new loop where I can end up saying, do I, am I meeting my performance standard? And if I'm not meeting my performance standard, I'm going to invest in more capacity. But it might take time 
for that capacity to actually end up growing and then, re -incre and then increasing my performance again. So this is tradition. So these really probably capture the dynamics in, say, most, say, commercial businesses where people would like to grow their market share, recognize their market share will end up being limited in part because their company can't scale well. And then it's a mitigation strategy for scaling well so that the company starts performing better over time. And so now when I'm modeling this, I now have a framework on which I can say, we need to make sure we keep this delay down, for example. Or um, maybe our performance standard has been set too low and it needs to be raised up. This provides us a vocabulary to talk about how we achieve our goals, which are maintained growth. Or how we deal with, uh, maybe we don't want growth, but we're getting growth. You know, growth of algae in a pool. How does this apply to that? How do I end up reducing the amount of algae growth in a pool by using this framework to think about that growth? On the flip side of that, maybe I'm not interested in growth. Maybe I'm interested in fixing problems. So if you're interested in fixing a problem, that sounds like you want a balancing loop. So you always start with a balancing loop. But you know that, uh, that just like with the road system, the road example, as you get congestion, building more roads doesn't necessarily solve the problem in the long run. So the problem comes back to haunt you. Well, that suggests that there is a reinforcing loop outside of your balancing loop, that no matter how much you're balancing, eventually you're going to get a reinforcing loop that brings the problem back. So because of that, I'm not getting at the real underlying cause, so I might have another uh, loop that will end up uh, the, either addressing the, uh, the real problem or the symptomatic problem. So they give the example here, I have a cash flow problem, I need more money. One option is to borrow, so I take credit out. And that solves my cash flow problem, that's a balancing loop. That is a short term fix. But we know that if you borrow a lot of money, you're going to have to pay a lot of interest over time. And if you pay a lot of interest over time, you'll have more of a cash flow problem than you started with. So that is showing here that my solution, the borrowing, ends up actually kind of contributing to the problem more in the end. So really what's going on here is I've got the real solution I should have looked for was to get financial controls. And so this is kind of like, this would have been the right solution that maybe I needed to tighten up my financial controls and that would have solved my cash flow problem. But because I have sort of a loose spending mentality, then I don't focus on financial controls, and instead, I focus on interest payments. So this describes, like this was one example, but there's a wide range of examples where people start with a problem, come up with a solution, wonder why that solution didn't work out over time, and ultimately, when you look back at it, it's because they chose the wrong solution. And ultimately, the reason they chose the wrong solution might have been that they were maybe just a little worried that they didn't have it in them to, to go to the, the, this solution. This is typically the harder solution. So this gives us a framework on which we can talk about the problems that will occur whenever you try to implement a, a fixing problems, be it on the roads, be it in your bank account, be it on whatever, your, your general time management. So this is process-driven. And so we can zoom out, and they have a bunch of different ways in which you can come up with different structures of loops where they're focusing on the loops and not the links. You have to put the links in once you recognize the loops have to be there. And my claim is all of these that Moorcroft uh, have are already represented in this list, but then this list also has a lot more. So when you need to, when you're just getting started out, like what are the, what are the basic elements of my model? This is often a really useful decision tree to use. What am I really trying to get at in building this model? Follow down through the decision tree, and then this gives you a simple thing to start with. And then you can add more complexities over time, but kind of the kernel of your system might be these loops that are identified in this decision tree. So that is another way of making these more complex problems diagrams. <coughs> So this is the two basic approaches. So before we go on to this more activity here, are there questions about this idea that I can use a decision tree to guide me through these 
different decision points that represent what I'm trying to model and ultimately land at a prototype for my system that I can draw, look for all the variables in, and then look to complexify on top of that. It just tells me a place to start. So the question's about that general approach. Yeah. What are like the endpoints of like the you know what I mean? Like yeah, what? like what does that like entail? So like like this one shifting the burden, which is the one we just showed before, this is kind of a little cartoon depiction of two balancing loops connected by a reinforcer. So the idea here is that um, if that maybe the first thing I do is not actually drawing the variables, but maybe I would say I'm expecting to have a big balancing loop next to another big balancing loop with a reinforcing loop. And then my next step would be to say, well, what variables would be in balancing loop number one? And then I'd say, okay, so I think uh, road congestion is in balancing loop number one. Road capacity is in balancing loop number one. I list all those things. And I say, okay, yeah, all right, I see. So I have built more roads to solve the congestion problem. And then I could see, well, what is in the other loop? And then I could come up with other variables. So this is meant to just be a way to get yourself started. Because a lot of times you're saying, well, what variables are of interest? Well, it's kind of like what I mentioned with the climate change. Do we always need to worry about sequestration and shells? Probably not, because that's just probably not relevant to most climate change questions. And if we depend on sequestration and shells, that's a bad solution for climate change. So, but I know that that is, is important. So, you know, I could just put it up there, brainstorming, how, what affects climate change? Well, sequestration and shells. I'll put it up there on the board. This tells you that not every variable should necessarily be scattered on a board or connected. Maybe you should start with the loops and then ask what variables are involved in those loops. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's kind of like, like the conclusion to all the variables in the system. That's right, that's right. And so we'll see uh, when we talk about this more on Thursday that Ultimately, the goal of these causal loop diagrams, at least in one case, is shifting your thinking from variables to links to loops. Because ultimately, we don't care about how many variables participate in a loop. A loop might have two variables, might have 20. But what's interesting is that it's a loop, that it's a feedback loop. And so feedback loops next to the feedback loops, that's where cool dynamics happen in systems that we're interested in, even if you know, the, the actual variables within those loops might be very different. Any other questions about this general approach? So let's practice this a little more in this sort of exercise here. So what we're going to do from, from here, so we're going to start an exercise that will be due on Sunday. And um, for Thursday, there's an article that's also associated with this exercise that's posted on Canvas, Applying Systems Archetypes. Um, I think some people have already uh, done the, um, the reading the at-home exercise on Canvas, but that'll be due as usual um, Wednesday night. And then we'll have an in-class reading assessment before the lecture. Um, so Sunday, we'll have today's assignment and the muddiest point, and then do before next lecture this reading exercise. And so it's uh, not out of the book. It's a separate PDF that's posted on Canvas under this module. All right, so what we're going to do in this activity is, uh, so there's basically, and I'll pass out the activity, but, um, but we kind of do this together. Uh, so, and then you'll be able to use what the kind of the group uh, solution is in the, the solution that you'll end up submitting on Sunday. So, what I want to do, so we'll take some time here, uh, and so in the next couple of minutes, you can form small groups around you and focus on S-shaped group uh, growth. And what I want you to do is, as quickly as possible, come up with an S-shaped growth causal loop diagram. Put the variables in, but don't label any of the links or the loops. So just draw a couple of variables in both in this loop, a couple of variables in this loop. Um, show the links, but don't label the polarities of them. And then we're going to swap with another group and have them label yours. And then we'll end up grabbing a couple of random ones and presenting them. And you can use those in what you'll, you'll ultimately end up submitting this uh, as question one on your, in the Sunday assignment. So let's take, uh, I mean, I don't know, five minutes or so and just try to come up with your best S-shaped growth one on a sheet of paper that you can pass with another group. Don't label the polarities, just put the links in. The variable names in the links. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
All right, if I haven't swapped to with another group yet, then try to close your loops ASAP so you can get swapped and labels. I should have been more clear. I said, you know, the links should be just links. I was so delayed.
Well, I think most everybody is swamped, but I want to make sure we keep momentum. So rather than the last the last couple groups, I think uh, let's just get some of the examples that have come up here. So um, so I've asked you to draw a bunch of variables and then ask somebody else to label them. So now what I want to do is kind of go around the room here and have you describe your S-shaped growth curve in terms of the loops. So I'll start with you guys. So the, the, the growth that's in front of you, how would you describe the one that you just labeled? Yeah. Are we describing ours at the end? I would say the one in front of you. Okay. So just to give everybody kind of a thought of what it is, so it's um, the number of housing developments is the one is like the variable that sits in between the two loops. So um, housing developments. Um, and there's a positive um, causal link to the number of people. So the more developments there are, then the more number of people there are. And then that's a reinforcing loop coming back to housing developments because the more people there are, the more number of housing developments will need to be built. And whereas on the, on the balancing side, um, that number of housing developments, the more that there are, the less land space that there is available. And then um, the more land space that there is available, the more number of housing developments will come back through. All right, so if I was to summarize that, I think that's an excellent example um, is that you've got two, you've got a, a growth in housing. So with the more houses, you've got, um, I guess, more interest in housing. So you've got, on one side, there's a number of, so as you get more housing developments, you get more people moving in. With more people moving in, there's a growth in housing developments. But ultimately, that's limited by land. So you've got a, a, you know, a growth in interest in housing, but then you've also got a limitation in land. And so those are the two things that they put there, and there are only three variables that are affected here. Number of people, number of housing developments, and land space. So that is you know, one example of an S-shaped growth. Yeah, it looks exactly like this, but it's in terms of housing. So, so let's uh, so let's see. So if I were to go back, so how would you guys summarize the loops in front of you? So to get that on the growth side, you've got to put money in your bank account. You get, um, it sounds like so, the money, you've got a growth loop inside your bank account. There's more money, you have more growth. With more growth, you have more money. And so on the limiting side? Um, the more All right, so I love that. Another excellent example. So on the growth side, they've got a bank account. And if the money sits in the bank account, it grows. But eventually, it grows so much, it kicks in the limitation side. The limitation side is if you realize you have a bunch of surplus cash in the bank account, you're probably going to go spend that. And if you spend it, you might be investing more of your time investment in the social life, which might actually take time away from hourly work which actually even reduces the amount of money you're putting back in the bank account. So there's a couple of different effects there that are depleting the money out of the bank account. So money in the bank account grows on its own, but eventually it becomes too tempting, and it ends up uh, actually defeating itself because it gets you to use that money. And as you use it, you might even reduce the, the fuel in causing the bank account to grow. So let me flip on to the other side here. So let's take... Um, your loops, so you sort of summarize your two loops. Okay, so the main part was social population. So we said that as the social population increases, or as it decreases, then environmental awareness would increase. And that would lead to an increase in conservation effort, which would lead to the population infancy again. But right, so on the balancing side, it sounds like you have a sea turtle population. With more sea turtle population, you get more conservation efforts as people get more awareness. Using more sea turtle population. Um, that's on the reinforcement. So, what's on the balancing side? Well, so on the balancing side, 
Oh, I see. I see. So I guess so as sea turtle populations go up, awareness of sea turtle populations will go up, which will decrease the pressure to save the sea turtles. So that's actually a, a balancing loop. So then what's on the reinforcing side? Are we on sea turtle So, so here we've got this so the sea turtle population. It's like as they're increasing, um, then, the, then the thought was, it looks like the thought here was the original one is that the, the tourists would decrease, and with, but with decreased, uh, those tourists are going to contribute to microplastics. The microplastics are, okay, I see. So, um, so the sea turtle, looks like there's a, the, the, the reinforcing loop here, looks like, I think the, the essence of it was that as more people come to see, as fewer people come to see the sea turtles, they'll actually pollute less, which will actually be beneficial for the sea turtles. If I sort of am understanding this, that's why you have two negatives that end up canceling each other out. So, you know, so that's sort of a, an example of where you can get a reinforcing loop out of a reduction of a reducing pressure. So by negating a negative, you can end up producing this sort of reinforcing. So I'm going to pause there so we can move on to the, the next one, which is a little more complicated one. But I hope you can sort of get the idea here is that you can start with two with a phenomenon and then ask what are the driving loops behind that phenomenon. So the last one I want to do here, um, and I'll pass as you start working on this with your group, I'm going to pass out this kind of assignment, which basically says, in the first part, you're going to draw on Vinsim a loop that is an S-shaped growth loop. And if you want to use the one that you were presented, that's fine. If you want to use one of the ones that I talked about up here, that's fine. But then we're going to do it again for this drifting goals. And then you've got this third one on your own. You'll end up drawing one that has three coupled feedback loops. It doesn't have to relate to any of the CLBs that we talked about. It just has to have three loops. So let's go ahead and with the, your group next in the last couple minutes we have, see if you can, and you can just, we'll not worry about passing them, see if you can start to come up with a drifting goals. Drifting goals is different than escalation. It has two balancing feedback loops. One of them um, has a corrective action where you notice a gap in performance causing you to correct the action to hopefully increase your performance. But the same, on the side, same side of that, that gap in performance also gives you a pressure to lower your goal. And that is another way to reduce the gap in performance. So on the bottom side here, you're increasing your performance. On the top side, you're decreasing your goal. And this is the so-called drifting goals archetype. So can you think of a way in which, or a system, um, and I've had people do a lot of creative ones here, some to do with relationships, uh, for example, that, um, that fits this kind of drifting goal. So I'll pass this out, but there's nothing that you can turn in here. This is also posted on Canvas. This is what's due on Sunday. So you can uh, last couple minutes just work with the group around you to come up with a drifting goals. Yeah, the, the attendance thing. 
So we'll do for the attendance. Um, we'll say that uh, an, an S-shaped growth curve always has a reinforcing loop coupled with what? What is the other loop? S-shaped growth is reinforcing plus what? What's the other loop? Okay. It's just the thing that's due Sunday. So it's the same thing as on Monday. This is just you know, what's due Sunday. It's exactly the same. Oh, so. Thank <laughs> you. 